Hey everyone, today we're going to take a look at some of the best practices that you can use to secure your Synology NAS. So first things first, this is going to be a comprised video of other videos that I've already created, but my goal is to put it in an order that you can easily follow so that you can be a little bit more comfortable with the security of your NAS. Now I have written instructions on this uh, and I'll leave a link for those in the description and those are basically just going to link you to some of the other videos and they will also hopefully provide a little background on some of the reasons why you should implement some of these things. So there's a few things that you have to be aware of before we get started. The majority of your NAS security is done preventatively. So what that means is that you have to try and predict some of the potential issues that might arise and some of the vulnerabilities that an attacker might want to exploit. So what you're left with is best practices that you can take to try and secure your NAS as much as you can. So we're first going to take a look at some of those best practices, and then we're going to take a look at how you can expose your NAS safely if you're interested in doing that. And a little later in the video, we're going to take a look at data security. So I just want to mention that I'm going to be doing all of this inside of DSM-7. DSM-6 is very similar, but some of the settings might be in a separate location, so just be aware of that. I also want to mention that this is not necessarily everything that you need to do to secure your NAS. These are some of the best practices that, in my opinion, you can implement to secure your NAS slightly more than it might be currently. So the first thing that you always want to do is disable the admin account. So make sure that you have a user account on your NAS right now that you created that has admin permissions. And what you're going to do is you're going to open up the control panel, you're going to select users and groups, and then you're going to edit the admin user. From there, you can select disable this account and save it. This is going to disable the admin user account. Now, the reason that you're doing this is because the default admin account is default. And generally, any of the default settings, especially user accounts, you always want to change those. So simply changing the password in this case is not enough. You actually want to disable this account and make sure that you're using a different username. The next thing that we're going to take a look at is two-factor authentication. So especially for the user account that you just created uh, or any of the user accounts that you have on your NAS, you want to make sure that you're using two-factor authentication. This ensures that if anybody is able to get your password, they still need that second layer to actually access the account. So to do that, you have to select the person icon in the top right and then select personal. From there, you're going to have to enable two-factor authentication. Now, I'm not going to be going over it in this video, but you're going to have to make sure that you enable the email notification service. That is required for two-factor authentication. But everybody should be using two-factor authentication, especially on your admin accounts. I personally enforce all user accounts to use two-factor authentication, and that's a setting that you can change inside of the security section. You don't necessarily have to do that, but for your admin accounts, you definitely want to do that. The next thing that we're going to take a look at is SSH. So in various tutorials that I've created, there are many reasons why you might have to SSH into your NAS. Uh, but generally, if this is something that you're not actively using, you want to keep it disabled. Uh, the reason for that is because it is significantly easier for an attacker to brute force a password rather than through the DSM login portal. And it's also important to note that the DSM login portal utilizes two-factor authentication, but SSH does not. So if you are actively using SSH, you can keep it enabled, but I want to make sure that you enable the next setting that we're going to take a look at, which is auto block, which can add a little bit of security to SSH. So for auto block, you're going to open the control panel you're going to go to security and then protection. And there you're going to see auto block. So you'll see two main settings that you want to configure. The first is login attempts. And then the second is within a certain amount of minutes. So basically, you can change this setting to say five if you want, uh, or even less than that if you'd like. But this is basically saying that if a user attempts to log in this amount of times within this amount of minutes and they fail, they will be added to the block list. And basically, they will not be allowed to log in any further. So for SSH, that is important because if somebody indirectly gets into your network and is trying to brute force your password through SSH, even if they try through, say, the first five attempts, they will automatically get blocked and you'll get a notification inside of DSM that states that someone from an internal IP address has been auto blocked. So that might tip you off that, you know, something's out of the ordinary. You might want to look into it a little further. So auto block is something that you should always keep enabled. Generally, if your network is secure and you've followed some of these best practices, you're probably not going to get any notifications for auto blocks. But Regardless, it's kind of a safety feature that you want to ensure that you have enabled. So the final thing that we're going to take a look at is Synology NAS DSM updates. 
So you always want to ensure that you're on the latest version of DSM. When updates are released, they're always fixing vulnerabilities. And that's not to say that that's a Synology specific thing. That is basically every vendor. So if you have a, a Windows PC, Microsoft is releasing security patches. If you have a Mac, Apple is releasing security patches. So you always want to make sure that you're on the most recent version of whatever operating system you're using. So to ensure that your NAS always updates properly, if you open up the control panel and select update and restore, you can select update settings and automatically install the new updates. I generally do Saturday nights, but you could do it whenever you'd like. And this will just ensure that your NAS stays up to date. So those are some of the best practices that I consider things that everybody should implement if you have a NAS. We're now going to take a look at accessing your NAS from outside of your local network. So without a doubt, the most secure way of having your NAS is having it only accessible to local devices. But that is also the most restrictive. So what that means is you'll never be able to access it outside of your local network. For a lot of people, that's fine. But for a lot of people, that's not fine. So we're going to look at a few options that you have on how you can access your NAS outside of your local network. And based on whatever needs you'll have, you should be able to determine what's best for you. So if we're saying that local network traffic is the absolute most secure, the second most secure would be utilizing a VPN. So a VPN server you can set up on your NAS. I have a tutorial on how you can implement OpenVPN. I'll leave a pop-up for that now. But all of these videos are also in the written instructions. So I suggest you just kind of keep that open and you can watch any of those videos if you'd like. Uh, but a VPN server is beneficial because you can open one port on your router and you're basically creating a secured tunnel back to your local network. So anyone trying to connect to your VPN will require a username, password, and a certificate. Generally, it's a config file if you're using Synology's OpenVPN. Uh, but basically, they need all three of those in order to connect to your VPN tunnel. Now, when they're connected, they can access any of the local resources on your network. So if you're using something like Synology Drive and you're also using something like Plex and you'd like to be able to access both of those, connecting to your VPN will allow you to access both of those because you can access all of your local resources. That is different than some of the other options we're going to take a look at. So be aware that while this is the most secure, it's also one of the most restrictive meaning that every single device that you would like to connect back to your NAS has to have that certificate, the OpenVPN client, or whatever VPN server you happen to be using. Uh, but they need to be able to connect to it before they can access your resources. So it's not a direct connection. They can't just pull up a web browser and access your NAS, for example. Uh, they have to first connect to the VPN and then they can access all of your local resources. So in most circumstances, this is the most secure way that you can access your NAS and your local resources outside of your local network. Now, the second and third ways are very similar, but they have a few differences. Uh, so we're quickly going to talk through both of those. So the second way is by port forwarding and using Synology's firewall. So if you have to access DSM, for example, and you want to access it outside of your local network, you have to port forward the HTTPS DSM port on your router. Uh, now, that is something that you have to be aware of because when you do that, you're technically allowing access to the entire world. For a lot of people, that is something that they don't want to do. So if you are doing that, you have to make sure you do it in tandem with Synology's firewall. So for example, if you want to be able to access your NAS from work, you would be able to either get the static external IP address of your works network or the IP range that they have uh, for all the devices on their network. And generally, you'll be able to use Synology's firewall to limit access to only those IP ranges. So I want to be clear here that this is not something that you should do if you want to just open it to the world. Generally, you have to restrict it in some way. So that could be something as simple as limiting it to your current country or something as complex as limiting it to the IP ranges of whatever network you're trying to connect from. Um, now, I want to be clear that this is probably something that the majority of people should not do. But if you're utilizing Synology's firewall, and I have a video in detail explaining Synology's firewall, I'll leave a pop up for that now. Uh, but if you're utilizing Synology's firewall, you can safely expose your NAS this way. For the majority of people, it's probably something you don't want to do. But for specific cases, this is a perfectly acceptable option. 
My one suggestion is that if you do decide to do this, I would suggest changing the HTTPS port from 5001 to being something different. Uh, just change it from the default. You can do that by opening up the control panel and selecting login portal and DSM-7, and then you can change the HTTPS port from 5001 to something different. Um, this is just strictly for no reason other than getting off the default port. So in summary, if you do decide to do this, make sure you watch the video on Synology's firewall so that you're utilizing it and securing it in the best way possible. Now the third way is by utilizing Synology's reverse proxy and Cloudflare. Now this requires that you own your own domain. So I have a video on Cloudflare that you can watch. Uh, and I have a video on a reverse proxy that you can watch. And in the written instructions, I have both videos. But Cloudflare is a free CDN, and it comes with a slew of security features that you can um, take advantage of if you do own your own domain. Now, there won't be a true benefit of having a CDN if you're accessing uh, DSM, for example, but the security benefits that it provides, in my opinion, are well worth it. So if you utilize Cloudflare and you utilize a reverse proxy in tandem with Synology's firewall, you should be able to limit access and securely access your NAS when you need to. This option is very similar to the last option, but you're gonna be utilizing your own domain name and you're gonna have Cloudflare on top of it. So those are the three ways that you can access your NAS outside of your local network. Um, generally, these are just guidelines. You have to do what's best for you. You have to do your own research and you have to make sure that what you're implementing is secure because when you expose personal devices, you are the one that has to make sure that you're utilizing some of the best security practices. So just keep that in mind. Now, the last thing that we're gonna take a look at is data security. So everything that we went over already is kind of securing your NAS, but securing the data on your NAS is equally important. So I have multiple videos on this in the written instructions, like I said, probably a thousand times by now, you can find all these videos. But the first thing we're gonna take a look at is scheduled snapshots. So if you're utilizing a NAS that supports BTRFS, you need to make sure that you have snapshots enabled. This will protect you from basic things like accidental file deletion to full-blown encryption. So God forbid you get a crypto locker or something similar, you can revert back to a prior version and all of your data would be safe. So this is something that you want to make sure you have enabled if you have BTRFS. This is Honestly, 99% of the reason I only suggest Synology NAS devices that support BTRFS because in my opinion, it is an invaluable feature and it's something that everybody should be utilizing. Now, the last thing is backups. So everybody knows that you need to have backups. It's, you know, probably been hammered into your head at this point. But I think there's a misconception on backups. And um, I'm going to try to clarify that, at least in my opinion, as best as I can. Now, if you're storing, say, 40 terabytes of data on your NAS, you probably don't need to store 40 terabytes of data off-site or in the cloud. You are perfectly free to do that if you'd like, uh, but you don't have to. You need to look at your data and determine what is the most important data for you, what would really upset you if you lost it. Now, when you look at it from that point of view, it's probably significantly less than you think it is. So for example, I have 15 to 20 terabytes on my NAS right now, and I'm only backing up a couple hundred gigabytes to the cloud. Um, now there are a few different ways that you can do that. I have three different videos. I have one that will show you how to uh, utilize Hyper Backup to back up to Backblaze B2. I have another one that will show you how to do it to a uh, offsite Synology NAS, and then a third way that you can utilize a Raspberry Pi. Generally, any of those are going to keep your data secure as long as it's off-site. Uh, but the important thing to highlight is that you don't necessarily have to back up all of your data. If you're backing up your local PC, for example, um, you generally have specific things on that PC that are important to you, and those are probably your personal documents, um, some of your personal data. But it's not going to be the operating system's files. So you have to make that distinction. You're not, you know, if you have a Windows PC, you're not going to back up to the cloud the Windows operating system files, but you are going to back up your personal documents. So look holistically at your data and determine what is important to you. And from there, you have to make sure that you're backing that data up. So I want to be clear that everything that we just took a look at, these are generally just best practices and things that I think that you should look into. Um, and these are ways that you can secure your NAS. But security is a moving target. 
Every single day, there's an attacker that's trying to expose something different. So the best thing that you can do is to try and be as restrictive as you can. Keep as few of admin accounts on your NAS as you can. Make sure that your user accounts have access to the things that they need and that's it. You don't wanna be giving access for everybody to everything. Um, you want to give individual user accounts access to the things that they might need. So this video does not necessarily go over all of the things that you should be doing to secure your NAS. For everyone, that's going to be slightly different. So these are just some of the best practices that I consider to be some of the kind of low-hanging fruit that you can quickly implement and secure your NAS slightly more than it might be currently. So hopefully this helped. It was a very long video. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and please consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks guys.